Wow, we can never forget what God has done. Each of you is here because God has done something wonderful in your life. And when I stepped into this church four years ago, I would have never dreamed what he was going to do with me or that I'd be up here doing this. My, my plan was just come with my husband, go to church, you know, take it easy. Don't let anybody know who I am, what I can do, or what I can do. <laughs> and, okay, do not bow your head, Amy. Um, <laughs> but, you know, God had a different plan, and thank him for, you know, what he has done. And, you know, I love women's ministry. I love ministering to women. And uh, each and every one of us is unique. Each and every one of us is special. Each and every one of us is beautiful. So, thank you. Uh, We are going to be tackling conquering guilt and shame tonight. I did teach on this once before, but there's a lot to remember. You forget a lot. you don't get it the first time. I mean, I've been over this many times, and, there, and I'm still learning. So I revised my notes a little. Since I don't, don't bow your head, Amy. Don't look down. Wait. Oh, here. That, yeah. See? <laughs> Something. Um, I'll raise my platform and keep my head up. <laughs> So anyway, it's, it's exciting to be here with you guys tonight and, and get to teach and, and that the Lord has a plan for each of you. And guilt and shame is something we have all struggled with and will struggle with. It, you have a paper that I passed out. It says shame. Who me? Because how do you know you have shame? And so strongholds, there are strongholds of shame. They're difficult to recognize, but we all have them. So a stronghold, think of that. It has a strong hold on you. And as you read down here, you are going to recognize things in your life, okay? Um, and you will see things that will just stand out to you. And so you, when you get home, go over this, look at it. You'll know what to pray about. You'll know how to think about things and how to conquer that. But I'm going to teach you how to do that tonight. Because there is a way to conquer guilt and shame. And we do that through who? Jesus Christ, our Lord. And he has come to set you free from all your guilt and all your shame. And uh, I'll teach you how to do this, how you can conquer this. And um, have any of you really ever thought about how do I conquer guilt and shame? It's not really even a thought that comes to you. So if I asked you to define guilt and shame, what, what would you say? How would you define it? How would you define shame to me? How would you define guilt to me? How would you define false guilt to me? And how do you know? what shame you have or or what it is. And are guilt and shame the same? How many of you think guilt and shame are kind of just kind of sort of the same? No. No. Right. So let's start by defining what each one of these is because they don't equate. They are actually completely different. Guilt is how we feel when we know that we have done something wrong. Okay, Um, And guilt will always violate our belief system. So if you have a belief system that says it's wrong to steal, whenever you steal, that violates your belief system, and guilt will come in. Um, So say you take something from somebody else that uh, it's not yours, but you take it. And then you feel guilty. Well, that's good. Because you did something wrong. And you should feel guilt for something that you've done wrong. And you know it's wrong. False guilt 
is feeling guilty for something that you haven't done wrong. For example, I feel guilty for missing that meeting. That wasn't wrong to miss the meeting, but you're still feeling guilty about it. False guilt. I feel guilty for not volunteering for that project. You feel guilty? Well, you didn't do anything wrong. Well. So that's a false <laughs> guilt. <laughs> I feel guilty for breaking that dish. Um, you didn't really do anything wrong. You had an accident. It's, it's a false guilt. You, you might feel sorry, and that's appropriate, but false guilt is not. And then you're not responsible for what someone else does. I think this thing needs to come down or something. Um, and false guilt often has the word should in it. I should have done this. I should have done that. And then you feel guilty. But you actually haven't done anything wrong. So don't keep apologizing for things that you haven't done wrong. And you know it's kind of built into us. You know when you kind of just accidentally do anything. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. It's not that you even did anything wrong. I bump into you. It's not wrong that I bump into you, but I say I'm, I'm sorry. And yet... We know that that kind of I'm sorry is oops, you know. Yes. But, um, but we often apologize for things uh, that we haven't even done. So guilt has a job, and its job is to expose sin. So when we sin, we should experience guilt, and we should experience through our God-given conscience. God gave us a conscience, um, and it lets us know that we have done something wrong. Uh, the good thing about it is that guilt in our conscience will lead us to repentance. We can confess our sin. We can have a change of heart. And we can go and make it right. When we go and make something right, it feels good. It sets off endorphins in our brain and gives us a, a feeling uh, of goodness, of, of rightness. Uh, there's a, f a freeing feeling there. And it doesn't even matter if the other person stays upset with you. You've done what you needed to do. You are released and freed because you made something right. Now, guilt is also based in behavior. It's your behavior. We feel bad for whatever was done, whatever behavior we had. So have you ever felt guilty for the way you treated somebody and you know you hurt them and you could even see it on their face? Well, that is behavior. Well, <laughs> one day... I got invited to go to the doctor with my daughter. And some of you have heard this story before, but it's kind of funny to tell again. And I became very angry with this doctor because she made this decision that was not in the best interest of my daughter. And I felt that it could cause my daughter great harm for her to make this decision. So I proceeded to be angry with her and get harsh with her in my words, and I actually saw the hurt and kind of almost a shock on her, her face that I was acting like this, but I was determined to protect my daughter. Well, as it turns out, I heard her wrong, <laughs> and, she, and I hadn't bothered to clarify what she had said. I simply heard one thing. I didn't say, excuse me, but did you say, no. I just reacted very badly, very sinfully, did it all wrong. I felt terrible. I felt guilty because I had done something wrong, and I knew it, and I knew I shouldn't have behaved that way. So regardless of the decision she made, even, it was, even if it was wrong, my behavior was wrong, and, and I felt guilty, and I should so I ended up apologizing to her quite tearfully, explaining that I thought the decision was going to harm my daughter. And can you change this?
Fix me, Holly. Is this better? Okay, I can look down now and talk. Billy, you better cut this part out of the video, okay? <laughs> Thank you, sweetie. Yes. Okay, can you hear me? Do I still sound like I'm on the microphone? Okay. So I'm, I'm tearfully apologizing to this doctor, explaining it, and then she understood why I acted like I did. So we were both sorry, and we were, we were fine. But guess what? I got fired from going to the doctor again. <laughs> until about a week ago, and this, was, this happened years ago, but until about a week ago, my daughter asked me to go to the doctor with her again, and I was really good. <laughs> So, um, so that is guilt. Remember, it's based in behavior. It's something you have done wrong, and your conscience tells you it's wrong. Okay? So now we're going to move over to shame. Shame is different than guilt, and shame is the problem. Do you know why? Because it's rooted in our identity. It's how we feel about ourselves. It's very deep. It's very profound. It starts in childhood. Um, and they're different because guilt wants to expose. But what does shame want to do? Shame wants to hide. Yes. And shame is a lie that we believe about ourselves. We feel ashamed about something, about how we feel about ourselves. But it's a lie. You see, because Satan watches us. He knows everything about our, our lives. And he knows how to effectively lie to us and cause us to believe it. And then we embrace that shame. We don't even know we're doing it. So shame certainly isn't from God. It's a tool of Satan that creates a fear of being found out and exposed because we don't want others to know something about us. Because after all, we need to measure up. We need to look good. And, and when we embrace shame, it causes a striving in our lives. We strive to measure up. We strive to perform correctly. We strive to get good grades. That was me. Um, we strive to look the best, be the best, act the best, have the best. Because we're trying to get over that shame. We're trying to cover it, hide it, uh, let no one see it. And we first see guilt and shame in the Garden of Eden when uh, Adam and Eve disobeyed God. And they had their eyes open to their nakedness. And I think it was probably quite shocking to them. And uh, they sewed fig leaves together and they covered themselves with the fig leaves but what did they do in the meantime? They hid, didn't they? They hid from God. They hid because shame hides. They were ashamed. They didn't want God to know what they had done. And they actually probably felt bad about themselves. They knew um, they had been disobedient. Well, and they also felt guilt for their behavior because they knew they'd done something wrong. They'd been disobedient. And they had eaten the forbidden fruit. I always wonder what it was. I know it wasn't really an apple, but it was something. <laughs> so what does God do? He gives them a chance to repent and to confess. To confess. He comes down and he talks to them, asks them some questions. And what did they do? They played the blame game. Adam says, it was the woman you gave me. It was her. She gave the apple to me and I ate it. And the woman says, it was the serpent. It was that serpent in the garden. So you see, they're not repenting. They're not sorry. They're blaming. So remember, shame is at the core of your identity, and it wants to stay hidden. And when it's exposed, it causes negative feelings. And some of those negative feelings that you may have experienced or are experiencing could be, I feel dirty. I feel defiled. I feel worthless. I feel like I have no value. 
I feel unaccepted and that I don't belong. And this list goes on and on and on with many different things. You'll see things on here. And then you have to ask yourself, where did that come from? You know, is it the truth? Or is it a lie? Shame says things like, I don't want anyone to know that I was physically abused. I don't want anyone to know that I was emotionally abused. I don't want anyone to know that I was sexually abused. I don't want anyone to know that I have an alcoholic parent. Or perhaps even as adults that I am an alcoholic. Um, I don't want anybody to know that I was abandoned. I don't want them to know I lived and grew up in, a, in poverty. I don't want them to know I had a drug problem. I don't want them to know I was into pornography. Uh, there's so many things we don't want people to know about them, us. I don't want them to know what an angry temper I have. Um, so shame brings a fear of humiliation, that you'll be humiliated with whatever that thing is, that you'll be put down and degraded in some way, that you'll be dishonored, disgraced, and embarrassed. You know, I cannot stand to be embarrassed by someone. I can't stand it. Don't embarrass me. And the worst person in the world that can embarrass me is my husband. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, you know what he did to me one time? We had a bunch of people over after church, and this was many years ago, and I had set all this stuff out, and I had some leftover stuff to make kind of this really, this dip that would be kind of cool. He told everybody I made it out of leftovers. Now, don't you think that would be embarrassing? You wouldn't want your husband to say that. But he doesn't even think about those things. He'll say, embarrass, or he'll embarrass me like, He'll ask me a question right in front of the person knowing that I'm going to give the answer that is the most appropriate and pleasing. Oh, yeah, you wouldn't mind that, would you, honey? That'd be all right, wouldn't it? Well, it wouldn't matter if it would or not. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say the right thing, right? <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but, you know, shame comes from so many different areas of our lives. It can be from divorce. It can be from broken relationships. Shame can come from disabilities. It can come from a loss of a job, a loss of finances, always being chosen last. Negative remarks of teachers, parents, or any authority figure in your life. Now, when I was growing up, there was great shame if you cried. You better not cry. You better not be a crybaby. And um, we were very belittled if we cried. And I was the oldest of five, so I had to be the strongest. And um, I was always told, you're the oldest. You're the biggest. You need to do this. You need to do that. So by the time I was eight years old, I had learned not to cry. I didn't cry about anything. And, and to this day, it is really hard for me to cry. So, um, And shame be can begin very early in life. It can actually begin at conception because shame is something that can be passed down generationally. If your parents feel a, a lot of deep shame, that can be passed into the womb and into you generationally because your spirit is alive and your spirit is functioning and it is determining all these things and it knows these things even though you don't um, at the conscious level. Um, shame can also begin with a reaction to abortion or rape. The baby's spirit will know. It, it can feel what the mother's feeling when, when you go through that. And all the um, things the mother would, all the thoughts she goes through, the decisions she has to make, uh, the baby's spirit is very aware of this. 
So shame can come in very, very early. Or um, an unwanted baby. Uh, and, and a little child, I never wanted you anyway. And screaming and yelling at them and being mean to them. I never wanted you anyway. It will set a deep core of shame into a child that they will, will live out. So um, I want to tell you a story about Stephen. I love this story. Stephen was a young boy, and he was filled with shame because he was born out of wedlock, and his parents were never married. His mother would often leave him for months because she had a drug problem, and sometimes she'd even end up in jail. And he would be given to his dad and bounced back and forth. So eventually, at the age of four, after many times of being bounced back and forth, Stephen was finally given to his dad. And his dad had, at that time, uh, just become a new Christian. And so he took Stephen, and he bought a home. And he, he took Stephen and embraced him with love. But as Stephen grew older, he realized uh, something about his name. And he became very ashamed of his name because his middle name was Judas. And his dad, having become a Christian and taught him Bible stories and taught him about Jesus, Judas became a very negative name for him. And so he was kind of feeling like, why did my mom give me that middle name? He also had very crooked teeth, and he was very ashamed of his teeth as he got a little older, and he wouldn't smile anymore, and he didn't want to talk. And then he, he also had a half-brother. Now, his half-brother had his father's last name, but he didn't. He had his mother's last name. So he had a very confused identity, very shame-based and, um, and so his dad, his loving, loving dad, who had become a Christian, taught him about Jesus and the Bible. His dad would leave questions for him out of the Bible every morning before he went to work so he could come home from school and answer Bible questions and talk with his dad about it. His dad put braces on him to straighten his teeth, and he changed his name. He gave him his last name, and he changed his middle name to the Bible name of Joseph, from the story of Joseph. He spoke to him often about God's love, and he loved him so deeply and was so good to him. He gave him his, a father's blessing. And so Stephen was able to grow out of his shame, to embrace the love of his father, and, and to know the truth. And the truth was that he had a father that loved him. His father taught him the truth about his mother. She's fractured. She's hurt. She has a problem. You need to love her anyway. So uh, that's what he did. And, and so Stephen was set free. He is a very healthy man today with children of his own and doing well. Um, but, you know, shame is full of lies, just like Stephen had all those lies affecting his life. Some of the lies, and, and think about this if you've ever felt this way. I don't deserve to be happy. I am worthless. I do not have any value. I am not wanted. I am not loved. I must perform for acceptance. I don't belong. There's something wrong with me. I know for me growing up, I always felt like I had to perform to be loved, that I wouldn't be loved if I didn't perform because I was the firstborn. I was supposed to be the best. I had to do everything right. I had to be the smartest. Man, my dad had me counting in German and... Spanish and English, and I mean, I'm only four years old, and I remember this. I had to know how to tie my shoes. That was hard. 
I couldn't figure out my right from my left. And he'd spin me around and jerk me and, and ABCs, you know. I, so you see, you see how that comes in? So I, I thought, I have to perform so my dad will love me. So when I got to school, I always worked the hardest and did the very best so I could bring home the best report card and he would love me. And he would make over my report card and I would feel loved. But you see the lie there? And do you see the shame that, that comes in at the core level there? So think about it. What has happened in your life that could cause you to feel some shame about yourself? How many of you have difficulty joining in and, and really having fun and playing without thinking about what someone else is thinking of you? How many of you could stand up here and dance a jig and feel comfortable about it? <laughs> okay, Cindy Lee, I got one. Yeah, because everybody's watching, everybody's judging, everybody's criticizing. What's your shame base? What are, what are, you, so afraid, what are you ashamed about? What, can you not do it right? Can you not do it good enough? Can you not measure up? So you see, all these things factor in to that, that shame base and how you're feeling about yourself. And yourself says, no, I'll look funny. No, I'll look ridiculous. But where did that come from? So, and what do you do with these lies? You take them to Jesus. You take them to the cross. And you renounce them. And you leave them there. And you speak the truth in their place. When you identify a lie, you must then speak the truth. And you must speak it out loud. Your heart and your mind must hear it. Okay, And you need to speak it over and over because the spoken word is very, very powerful. And your heart and your mind will believe what you speak to it. So you need to be speaking this. I deserve to be happy. I deserve to be here. I am of great worth. I am highly valued. I am wanted. I am loved. I don't need to perform. I'm accepted. I belong. I belong to the family of God. And there's nothing wrong with me because, God, I'm perfect in your sight. doesn't mean we do everything perfect, but we're perfect in his sight. And we can't believe the lies of the enemy because he will try to destroy you with shame. He has come to kill, steal, and destroy, and shame is his tool. Shame also has negative physical and emotional effects. Physically, what do you think shame might cause? Well, anybody here ever have headaches? Pressure and tightness around your head? You can't think clearly. You get nauseated. You have stomach pain. You have intestinal problems. You can literally feel paralyzed. You can be constipated, have diarrhea, all kinds of things can go on with this. Now, emotionally, shame can be so deep that it causes personality disorders. And you've heard of borderline personality disorder. You know, narcissism, passive aggressive, all of these things are personality disorders. Emotionally, it, you will find addictions. And you'll find erratic behaviors. Because shame is behind every single addiction. And it's behind erratic behaviors. Because shame causes you to feel just shattered inside. Just absolutely shattered inside. So guilt and shame are very different. They're not the same. And they speak very differently. Let me show you how they speak. Guilt says... I failed. Shame says, I'm a failure. See how different that is? Guilt says, I made a mistake. But shame says, I am a mistake. You see the lie in that? You're not a failure. You're not a mistake. But you see, you see the difference there. <clears throat> and failing by the way, does not make you a failure. Um, 
Mistakes are stepping stones to success. You know what failure is? Failure is not getting up and trying again. That's failure. You just stay down. So how do we conquer guilt and shame? Well, here's how we conquer false guilt. By realizing that we haven't done anything wrong and not taking on that false guilt. You haven't done anything wrong. So there you've conquered uh, false guilt. You conquer guilt with forgiveness. Forgiveness. Anybody here have trouble forgiving? (laughs) Sometimes, huh? (laughs) Um, You go make your wrong right. Go right the wrong. Then forgive yourself. You know, I think that's something that we forget to do. We forget to forgive ourselves. And then... You have to let go. You have to let go of the guilt. I mean, I look back in my life, and the enemy will beat you up with your past. How many of you know this? He will just beat you up. Oh, I wish I could go back and change this. Oh, I wish I could go back and change that. Oh, I wish I could do this different. Oh, I wish I had done more for my mom or my dad or my sister or my brother or, or something. But, you know, sometimes when you need to go back and make something right, it's too long past. Maybe the person doesn't exist anymore. Um, You can't talk to that person. But you can make it right between you and God. And you can still forgive yourself because God knows. And you know what? God can transcend time. You know, maybe you don't even have access to someone. They're still alive. You don't have access. God can transcend time. And, And so you want to go to him with this. So what do you do for guilt? What do you do for guilt? Shout it out. Forgiveness. Yeah? That's right. Make it right. Mm -hmm. Good. Forgive yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, repentance is key. Repentance is key. It's a gift from God for us to be able to repent. Forgiveness is a gift from God because it frees us. Not the other person. It frees us. How do we conquer shame? Woohoo! Guess what? Truth. Truth. We conquer shame with truth. Because the lies about yourself must be broken. Now you know how you feel about yourself. You know what you think of yourself. And if it's negative, guess what? It's not from God. So, do you love yourself? Do you like yourself? Do you think well of yourself? Do you think you're stupid? You know, sometimes I get really mad at myself and say, you are so stupid. Do you know you should never do that? Give the enemy a foothold with that kind of stuff. And boy, do I mess up once in a while. Um, So, anything negative you're thinking about yourself is only from... Satan. And he wants you to keep believing that. So you need to go back and take a look at yourself and see where you need to start speaking some truths over yourself. You know, and if, if, you've, if you're coming out of a shame base, this is going to take a lot of practice. You're going to have to do this a lot, daily probably multiple times a day. And go with the Lord. Spend time with him. Talk to him about how you're feeling about yourself. Talk to him about why you feel bad in an area of your life. And, and you know what we talk about a lot? My, my temper, my, my anger. Ooh, you know what happened today? Should I tell you? <laughs> Louis up in his office working, right? So this picture comes in from the post office, and I'm going to hang it up. Well, I have to take another picture down to put this picture up. So I put that picture up because i get to give the other one away to a little kid because we don't have the kid bedroom anymore. I'm turning it into adult bedroom. Well, then the, the sign over here that says faith has to now be moved over here. 
well, that stupid thing, there's a nail on each side. Why can't there just be one in the middle and you just hang it? Because, because you know how Louis hangs a picture? He goes and gets like this T-square thing, and then he gets a level, and he has a pencil and everything, and it takes a long time. Do you know I can hang a picture in less than a minute? Uh-huh, yep, that looks good. Nail, hammer, dun, 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 dun. Hang the picture. I'm done. Well, I needed Louis' help to position the picture. I said I had to stand back so I could see where it should go. So we're putting, I'm trying to put this thing up in that stupid thing with a nail on each side. I'm like, pound the nail here, pound the nail here. Dang it, it's crooked. <sighs> so, you know, Louis, I'll be right back. I'll get my level. <laughs> Do you want me to fix this for you or not? And he's going, are you okay? Are you stressed? Yes, I'm stressed. <laughs> a stubborn picture. It just needs, why can't they just put a hook in one place on it? Just, you know, and I'm, and I'm, and I'm, and I'm having to rewrite my notes and, and all this stuff is happening. And I get a phone call from a friend whose grandson ended up in jail and all this stuff is happening. Poor Louie, he is so good. He says, let me do it. So I did. I backed off. I went downstairs, let him do it, came back, looked beautiful, but, you know, he had his stuff out to do it, but he did it. <laughs> so it's been one of those days where, like, there's little gremlins coming after you. So I get here. We're sitting downstairs. It's after dinner, and I realize I have no notes. I forgot my notes. Oh my God. Yeah. So now, oh, no. And Louis has left already. Fortunately, he is Mr. Techie, and in the forerunner that you can't call, he knows how to make the phone work and answer it. So I told him what happened. He says, okay, I'll go get him. I'll be right back. I said, okay, you'll probably get here before they finish the music and stuff. So I have to give my wonderful husband a plug for putting up with me. But that's my difficulty. Yeah, the anger, you know. Me, I, I, I just got angry. And I apologized to him later. He says, oh, I don't consider that a blow up, which means I've been a lot worse in the past, right? <laughs> so anyway, but, you know, Jesus understands our shame. He went through a lot of it, but he knew who he was. And it could not affect his identity because he knew he was the king of kings and lord of lords. He was shamed because he was falsely accused. He was shamed because he was literally stripped of his clothing. He was crucified on a cross, which was a very shameful, shameful death. He was mocked and a crown of thorns put on his head. Very shameful, whipped, very shameful. All these things were extreme shame. He understands shame. And um, Hebrews 12.2 tells us that Jesus scorned the shame. He scorned the shame. And for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. So ladies, scorn your shame. Scorn your shame, and for the joy set before you in Jesus Christ, go forward. Go forward for that joy. Go forward and scorn, scorn that shame. Satan's defeated when the truth is spoken. He can't conquer the truth. So Jesus doing that on the cross, do you know what that means to us? It means he took all our guilt and shame. He took it on the cross, and he bore it for us so that we wouldn't have to. He did it all at once for every single person, and he set us free. But you know what? It's up to us to choose to walk in that freedom. So remember, it's the truth that sets you free. Knowing who God says you are is what counts. It doesn't matter what somebody else says about you that's negative. 
It's what God says about you that counts. You've got to find your identity in Jesus. Um, You know, when I was divorced, out of work, no longer owned a home, I realized how much of my identity I had put in that because I became extremely shame-based, extremely. I didn't want anybody to know that I didn't own a home. I didn't want anybody to know I was out of a job. I didn't want anybody to know I was considered at a poverty level at that time. You know, and I, I had no marriage. My marriage was gone. And that was an extreme uh, time of shamefulness for me. But when the Lord taught me where I was putting my identity and that I, my identity needed to be in him and what, and what he said about me was the truth. But you see, I wasn't performing. I wasn't measuring up. So how could I be loved? And that stems back to how my father made me feel. And I felt God was ashamed of me and disappointed in me. And I couldn't measure up to him either. Again, plays back into that that childhood. But God says you are the righteousness of Christ Jesus your Lord. And Jesus sees, or God sees us just as he sees his son Jesus. He sees us as the righteousness as the righteousness of his son, Jesus. Um, Shame and guilt can have no power over us when we speak the truth. And I'm going to speak some truth to you. You are the bride of Christ if you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. If you haven't, I'd like to see you up here tonight. And I'd like to pray with you. And I'd like to give you see you receive the greatest gift in the entire world that will transform your life beyond what you can imagine because it transformed my life. You are God's daughter. He's your father. You're royalty in the highest kingdom. You are precious in his sight. And you are the beloved of the beloved. He's in love with you. He loves you deeply.